Well, thank you, choir, and thank you, Matt. And as you can see from all the red up in the choir loft, today is Wear Red Sunday, and I'm glad that many of you remembered that and wore something with a little tint of red in it. I have a red and blue necktie on. That's about the extent of it. About uh, five years ago or thereabouts, maybe six, I purchased an all-red dress shirt just for this Sunday. And wouldn't you know, this morning I went downstairs and I ironed a white shirt out of habit and put it on. And just about the time I was getting ready to, to leave, my wife said, you remembered to wear red today, didn't you? Oh, I had on a nice blue and gray necktie. I mean, I really looked sharp. And I said, oh, no, I forgot all about it. So at least I was able to grab a tie out of the closet, but I was not going to iron another shirt. I can tell you that much, at least not at the last minute. Well, if you brought your bulletin along today, or if you have it with you, inside is an insert with our scripture reading, which is 1 Peter chapter 2. And for those of you who are guests, and I have met a couple of guests this morning, we are going through 1 Peter, and today we are at the conclusion of chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, and I'll be speaking from and we'll be reading together from the New King James Version of the Bible. Will you stand, please? As we read God's Word together, go ahead and take your slip, and let's recite the Scripture together. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thank you. May you be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. I want to again read verse 24, which says, in speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. This has to be one of the most significant statements of the New Testament, making this one of the most significant verses of the New Testament. All of us, I'm sure, from the time we were children, have heard John 3.16, probably the most familiar and beloved verse of the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, here is one that parallels that John 3.16 in importance and in significance. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He did that. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now let's think about that phrase for a moment. I've already remarked that it's extremely significant. Why? Well, here we have a statement that talks about all of these doctrines, all of these concepts, all of these ideas that I'm about to share with you things that we preach from the pulpit, things that our Sunday school teachers present to their adult friendship classes and to our children. That if you go through a study of theology proper, that is the doctrine of this, the doctrine of that, the doctrine of the... Eventually you'll come to these doctrines, these ideas, because they are critical to our understanding of what it means to be a Christian a Christ follower, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The first thing that jumps out at me is substitution. He bore our sins. He is our substitute. Rather than we bearing our own sins and standing before God someday at the judgment guilty, 
He bore our sins and experienced the judgment of God at the cross. Substitution. He suffered our hell for us. We think of the sayings of Jesus on the cross. I've done at least twice a series of sermons on the seven final remarks of Jesus before his death at Calvary. And one of those was, I thirst. And as we meditate upon that I thirst that came about at the end of the three hours of darkness and of judgment when the full burden and weight of humanity's sin was placed upon Christ. We think also of the episode that Jesus shared in his earthly ministry when he talked about the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and said, I thirst in this place. Send Lazarus over with a drop of water, for I am thirsty. And we realize that he is our substitute. It's experiencing our eternal punishment from God he bore our sins so that we didn't have to bear them ourselves. So the first thing that leaps out at me as I study this phrase is substitution. The second thing that jumps out is atonement. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed, to add to the phrase. Interesting verse of Scripture, it, of course, is taken from Isaiah 53. Peter is writing to people who are desperate for hope. That's the original audience of 1 Peter. And as we go back to chapter 1 and see the introduction, we see these people are scattered throughout the empire. Why are they scattered? They're not just getting up and moving because they want to move. They're being persecuted. And they're scattering, trying to find a place of refuge, a place where they may safely worship and serve Christ and raise their families and do all those things that people want to do. Just live in peace and safety and security. To love their family, to raise their children, to see them turn out and become productive citizens. This is a, a commonly held dream of people universally. And that's why they're scattered. Because as Christian people, they are being persecuted by the Roman authorities who are telling them, bow the knee to Caesar. And they're saying, no, we bow the knee only to Jesus. Then you must leave. And so they have left. These are people in need of hope. And to these people, Peter is here saying, by his stripes you were healed. An obvious reference, not to the body, but to the soul. We've been made at one with God. We have found our peace with God. The righteousness of Jesus has been applied to us and we have found ultimate and permanent and eternal healing of what would otherwise be our guilt-ridden, conscience-disturbed, sin-embedded souls. Now, this, this verse from Isaiah 53 does hold out a promise of bodily healing, but that is in the resurrection when we receive our new eternal bodies without sin and without corruption. But this is a reference to atonement. We are now at peace with God, at one with God. Substitution, atonement, 
Of course, there's a reference here to the crucifixion. We can never get away from the cross, and that's what we're going to be talking about further this morning. The crucifixion, the symbol of Christianity worldwide is the cross. We use the term the crux of the matter, meaning this is the essence of an argument or the essence of a policy statement or a, the essence of a situation. The word crux is the same word from which we get crucifixion. And it is that crucifix, that crucifixion, that cross that symbolizes all for which Christianity stands. Worldwide, as I said, recognized as a symbol of Christianity. It's the cross that is the crux of the faith. The verse goes on. Propitiation, a word that we don't use in our everyday vocabulary. It is used in Romans chapter 3, and it means God is satisfied. It actually means a little more than that, but for our purposes today, it means God is satisfied with what Jesus did at the cross. Nothing more needs to be added. Propitiation. God the Father is satisfied with the redemption, the sacrifice, the atonement of Jesus. It speaks of imputation. He bore our sins. His righteousness becomes ours. Our sins are laid upon him. It speaks of justification. We now stand before God just as if we had never sinned. It speaks of sanctification. We have been healed. Our souls have been redeemed. And it speaks of future glorification by whose stripes you were healed. And I've already mentioned that this finds its complete fulfillment in the resurrection when we receive our new bodies. So this is a powerful verse of Scripture. It's one of the more important verses in the entire New Testament. It reminds us of Isaiah 53, but also of Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, where the Scriptures say, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. We are cursed, now he is made the curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who dies on a tree, Deuteronomy 21, 23, and that's the, ver, uh, the word, rather, that uh, Peter uses here. He died on the tree. In Galatians 3, 13, cursed is everyone who dies on a tree, a quote from Deuteronomy 21, 23. Now, that's an interesting term also, isn't it? On the tree. What's interesting about that is that the tree is presented here in a primitive state. I think that even in this early stage of the church, people were taking the symbol of the cross and making it an ornament, trying to beautify it and dignify it and take away the horror of the cross. And so both Paul and Peter used the term the tree. The tree presents it in a primitive way, in a criminal way. I've seen photographs of the electric chair. Actually, I was reading and then watched a documentary on a serial killer of about 20 years ago who was put to death by the name of Ted Bundy. A uh, warped individual, completely insane, and yet presented himself as suave, sophisticated, intelligent. He'd been to law school. He knew the law, 
and he persuaded young women. He was handsome, and, and he had some money, and he persuaded young women to date him and to like him, and then he would kill them. Some estimate he killed up to 100 women as a serial killer. He admitted to killing 30, which I, that, how this, I don't understand. Some things are beyond me. I do not understand. When I worked for four months, so I'm no expert, but when I worked for four months with fellows who were on parole from prison, trying to rehabilitate them into society. I realized then, after about three weeks, I realized there is such a thing as a criminal mind, and I just don't get it. But they have it, and so this man had one. But in my reading and in the documentary I observed, it showed the primitive nature of the electric chair in which he was finally executed. It was just a wood chair wired up to kill. Primitive, nothing comfortable about it, nothing attractive about it. Apart from the wiring, if it were a chair you had at home, you would probably have it in the garage or in the basement because there was nothing about it that was beautiful or appealing or attractive or inviting. And that's the reason the word tree is used. There's nothing about the cross that was appealing or attractive or inviting or ornamental or beautiful. It was a place of death and of execution. The crux of the matter is the cross. Christ's sacrifice on the cross is pivotal throughout the scriptures. It is indeed the crux of the matter. Pictures of Christ in the Old Testament, the fulfillment in the New Testament. We have Adam and Eve having sinned, clothed with the skins of animals. We have others as well. We have uh, Abram, or Abraham as he's known in Genesis 22, taking his son to Mount Moriah there to be sacrificed. We have the Levitical sacrifices under Moses being instituted where lambs and goats and oxen and birds were sacrificed, reminding those presenting them to the priest that something has to be given and something has to die so that they might find their peace with God, the ultimate justice. We have the announcement of John the Baptist in pointing to Jesus and announcing to the audience that was assembled before him, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have the event itself at Calvary, and then we have the remembrance of it in the church every time we observe communion, the taking of the Lord's Supper, as it is called. But it reminds us that Christ the eternal Son of God became flesh, this bread is my body, and gave himself on the cross, this cup is my blood. And so it is that the cross is the crux of the matter. Well, when we're thinking of the cross, I would like for us to remember three things. And now, that the introduction is over. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pastor, for that introduction. Now let's get to the, the sermon. All right, here we go. Number one, three things we want to remember about the cross, and I'm poking fun at myself, which isn't too hard to do if you really know me. Number one, Jesus gave his life for me. 
let's not say us. If we say us, that's the truth. But this morning, in your mind and in your heart, say it. Jesus gave his life for me. In fact, let's just say that together. Ready? Jesus gave his life for me. Me. He gave his life for me. Nearly every book of the New Testament mentions this and teaches this. Second and third John do not. And I think it's the little one chapter of Jude does not. But all the major writings of the New Testament, all the major books, second and third John are one chapter as well as Jude. And there's a reason for that. But repeatedly throughout the New Testament, we are reminded Jesus gave his life for me. Now, just a couple of months ago was Christmas. And at Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. But you do know, don't you, that nowhere does Jesus tell us to celebrate or to remember his birth. He tells us to remember and celebrate his death. With this bread, with this cup. And we will never understand the significance of Jesus' birth unless we understand the significance of his death. The cross is what gives us hope. And of course, that wonderful event that accompanies the cross, which is the resurrection. This is what gives us hope. When George H. W. Bush was Vice President of the United States. The Russian Premier Leonid Brezhnev passed away. And President Reagan asked Bush if he would represent the United States at the funeral of the former Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. Bush complied and represented our nation at this very solemn state funeral of this communist, presumably atheist leader. But I'm reminded of what Khrushchev once said. In public, we communists are atheists, but in private, many of us are believers. Just before the burial of the remains of Mr. Brezhnev, his widow, Mrs. Brezhnev, approached the bier. She stood motionless by a, for a moment, and just before it was closed, Mrs. Brezhnev performed an act of great courage and great hope a gesture that struck the Vice President of the United States and all those who were assembled as a great act of piety, of faith, of hope. She reached down and she made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. And that is what is happening at this time that the photo is taken. Mrs. Brezhnev is making the sign of the cross over the body of her deceased husband, Leonid Brezhnev. As our vice president later was to say, there in the citadel of secular, atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband had been wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who had died on the cross and that she was hoping that that same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. And so I ask you, since we're looking at 1 Peter, an epistle that's providing hope to people, in the final analysis, where was her hope? 
It wasn't in the power that her husband held. It wasn't in the power of those assembled around the beer and the coffin. It wasn't in the materialism that they possessed. In the final analysis, her hope and ours is found in this truth. Jesus gave his life for me. Second thought, 1 Peter 2, 24, that we, so Jesus gave his life for me, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Now, Jesus gave his life for me. Second thought, we are to live our lives for him. Everybody needs a purpose in life. Everybody must get up in the morning with the thought, there are certain things I must do today. There is a purpose for my being alive. And we can have a multitude of purposes today. I want to do this today. I want to do that today. I want to do the other. But ultimately, there must be an ultimate purpose. Why do I live? Why do I exist? What is it all about? Well, here it is. That we might live for righteousness. That we might live for righteousness which is another way of saying to live for the glory of God, to be right with God, to be right with others, to have the power to do what's right. Jesus made the remark, you are my disciples if you do whatever I have commanded you. Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? If you do whatever I have commanded you. We look at ourselves in the mirror and so often evaluate ourselves. And when we do so, we think, oh, I could have done better here. I could have done better there. I should have said this. I should have done that. And when it comes to following Christ, we frequently, in a moment of true honesty with self, will say, man, I need help. Well, the good news is, the gospel is, you've got that help. Jesus said, it's necessary for me to go to the Father so I may send a helper to you the Holy Spirit. Well, what is this helper or this comforter? Parakletos is the word translated comforter <clears throat> in the King James Bible. Most of us uh, are familiar with that, or at least many of us are, but the word parakletos means one who is a helper. A helper. A helper. What's he supposed to help me do? Right here it is. That I might live for righteousness. Because we know as natural people, that's not what we do naturally. So we need a helper. Well, we've got one. And that's the Holy Spirit who makes the reality of Christ come alive within us. Because of the cross and because of the resurrection, we have within us as followers of Jesus, as those who believe on Jesus, a supernatural power. The helper, the Holy Spirit, enables us to say no to temptation and yes to God, no to wrong and yes to right. Jesus lives in us. A little girl in the car driving home from church 
turned to her mother and said, Mommy, there's something about the preacher's message this morning that I do not understand. The mother said, Really? Oh, what is it? And the little girl replied, Well, he said that God is bigger than we are. He said God is so big that he could hold the whole world in his hand. Is that true? And the mother replied, Yes, that's true. But mommy, she said, he also said that God comes to live inside of us when we believe in Jesus as our Savior. Is that true also? And again, the mother assured the little girl that what the pastor had said was true. And with a puzzled look on her face, the little girl then asks, Well, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? And with that, the anecdote ends. Because we are supposed to answer that question to our own satisfaction. Does he show through you? Does he show through me? Some things we never forget. Some sermons, I guess, we never forget. I can remember as a child, and what reminds me of it is I keep a bottle of water up here just in case I have a coughing spell. I remember as a child being taken to a Baptist church in the south part of Akron where revival was being held. Revivals were a big thing in that day and time, and the evangelists, and evangelists, again at that day and time, pre-internet, pre-smartphone, black and white television, they could be very entertaining speakers, like they had to be. The evangelist had a cup of water that he held up. It was full, filled to the brim with water, and he said, now, if I knock this, what's going to spill out of it? He tipped it in some harmless little puddle of water fell on the floor. He said, whatever you're filled with, when you get bumped, that's what comes out. If you're filled with anger, you get bumped. You fly into a rage. If you're filled with positive thoughts and happiness, you get bumped, then that comes out. If you're filled with Jesus and you get bumped, that ought to come out. That really ought to come out. How does it come out? I think of Francis of Assisi who used to tell his followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If necessary, use words that we might live for righteousness. Words become necessary at times. But the way we live speaks loudly of what's inside. So number one, three thoughts. Jesus gave his life for me. Number two, we are to live our lives for him. And number three, because of the cross, there are now no barriers between us and God. By whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Which is another way of saying, you have now found peace with God. You have now been reconciled to God. There are no longer any barriers between you and God. Everything is okay. Everything is okay. You're okay with God, and he's okay with you. That only comes through the cross. And our acceptance of what Jesus did for us and our believing in him. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was one of the notable poets of the first half of the 19th century, the early 1800s. She became very popular both in England and America for her poetry. Unbeknownst to many people, her poetry was written from a heart that had been broken. 
And maybe that's what made her a notable and great poetess. But she had fallen in love with Robert Browning, much to the dismay of both her parents, who had hoped she would do better, let's say, than to marry a writer. They had hoped their daughter would marry someone in high society, not some writer. But she loved him and she married him anyway. Earning the scorn and the disapproval of her parents, they disowned her. Her parents were rather wealthy, well-to-do, and they disowned her. Almost weekly, following her marriage to Mr. Browning, she wrote a letter, a love letter, to her mother and dad, asking that they might be reconciled. They never once replied, and after 10 years of letter writing, Elizabeth received a huge box in the mail. She opened it, and to her dismay and her heartbreak, the box contained every single one of those letters that she had written to her parents, none of which had ever been opened. And today, those letters are on display in a museum. And according to one analyst, he writes this, Today those love letters are among the most beautiful in classical English literature. One has to wonder if her parents had opened one or a few of them if they would have not noticed the loving heart that reached out to them and asked to be reconciled. This morning, I want to remind you that God is a God with a loving heart. A loving heart that reaches out to all of us and wishes to be reconciled. How do we know that what I've just told you is not a bunch of empty words? How do I know that God is a God of a loving heart who reaches out to us with a desire to be reconciled. How do I know that? I know that from the cross. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let us pray. And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here today who have not made a commitment of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or perhaps you're here today with a burdened heart. Or as Charles G. Finney used to call it, an anxious soul. Or perhaps you just have questions about life and about our church. Standing in the worship center this morning are our deacons and their wives, and they are scattered throughout the congregation. Take a moment and look and see where they are and who they are. And if there is a need in your life to know Christ or to be assured of your salvation, to have prayer for your soul, for your anxious heart, or to have your questions answered, please see them after the service. Dear Father in heaven, today we have looked at this passage from 1 Peter 2, intended to give hope to a troubled soul, to people scattered throughout the Roman Empire and now in Asia Minor because of their faith, those who had escaped the Roman Empire and its, its boundaries in hopes of being able to worship Christ and to serve him freely. This hope is given. Remember that God loves you 
and Christ gave himself for you. And that's how we know it. He's healed your soul. He'll bring healing to your life. Friends, if you're here today with a need in your life, let Christ touch you and bring his divine healing into play. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.